Ibrahim is a celebrated visual Ghanaian artist known for his impactful installations that delve into themes of globalization, trade, and colonialism, particularly within the context of Ghana. He launched the Savannah Center of Contemporary Art and Red Clay Studio Complex in Tamale, Ghana. A lot of things uh, only work here in the West. Once you move outside the West, then it's almost as if time stops. But for me, that's where art becomes important. It was always tough for me, so I used to cry a lot. Uh, yeah, you know one of those Tom and Jerry cartoons when they're crying in the fountain? Yeah, I used to cry like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very bad, but I found peace in drawing. We as artists are extremely privileged in ways that even if we think that our life is precarious because we don't make enough money or whatever, but we hold views in the world that most people in the world can barely think about. Abraham, <laughs> thank yeah. you so much for joining me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. I would like to introduce you to our audience so they have an idea about who you are. So Ibrahim is a celebrated visual Ghanaian artist known for his impactful installations that delve into themes of globalization, trade, and colonialism, particularly within the context of Ghana. He launched the Savannah Center of Contemporary Art and Red Clay Studio Complex in Tamale, Ghana, pioneering artist-run spaces that bolster the local and global art dialogue. Ibrahim's art has been featured in major international exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale and Documenta 14, establishing him as a key figure in contemporary art. And his notable exhibitions, such as Lazarus at White Cube and Garden of Scars in Amsterdam, have garnered international acclaim for their innovative approach and deep social commentary. Once again, thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for joining us today. And congratulations on your work in the Saudi Alula Desert. You just came back from that, yeah, right? Yeah, I just came back, yeah. That was a remarkable experience. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. I can't wait for all of us to see and follow how the beauty of your works impacts the world. Oh, certainly. Thank you. So I would like to open with a beautiful question. What is art? <laughs> That's an interesting question, really. What is art? Yeah, I guess I always say that art is about freedom, the exploration of freedom. You know, sometimes in life, um, some things are bound within certain uh, within certain timelines. Uh, for instance, uh, you have a society that maybe is trying to set itself free or trying to create several liberal points, things like that. For instance. Um, during the colonial period when people wanted their independence, things like that. And then so many things are happening and then that independence comes and then maybe there are crisis moments within it where people are not able to, for instance, uh, um, yeah, I guess carry on that freedom in a way that is distributed among, let's say, population and things like that. And then it creates all these different bubble moments. Uh, there are objects that which are trapped in time, there are societies which are trapped in time, their consciousness that are trapped in time, things like that. And then artists who are living within that society or who are born along say, okay, I'm <clears throat> going to look at all that has happened within history and I'm going to find ways in which I can unearth or, yeah, because in a way we as artists, we are somehow like archaeologists or time travelers in a way. We somehow always anticipate that we've seen the future, we've lived in the future. And based on that, we want to go back in time and we want to um, somehow uh, make certain subtle interventions that somehow uh, reinvigorates the consciousness of people. And that's where art becomes important. That's where art is born. Art is not necessarily because at the time you made an object or anything, or not an object itself, but there are so many constellations and the object becomes one of it. So sometimes it's a process, how we go through the process of producing something. In that process, you're able to change so many things. There are class struggles, the economic situations, their political situations, ideological situations, all these things, positions that maybe your work is able to uh, touch in the process of art happening. So the question is, what really is art? Like you asked what is art, but what really is art? Is art when a phenomenon is, is made? Or is the process of making a phenomenon? Or it's like, for instance, we're talking about red clay when I built this institution. It's when they, they, they build up the institution, you have architecture, you have poetry, you have like uh, technology because have airplanes, trains, all these things. What is really artistic about this institution? It, what is art within it? Is the arts, the things that are put together, the constellation, 
or is it a process of putting the things together, the research, going to places, talking to people? Uh, so it's a very broad question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what contemporary art aimed for when it was birthed back in the 80s and all that. But as the 21st century has come along, we've come to realize that we're still somehow stuck to a lot of questions which were bound to the 20th century and before. And it doesn't really because till date, if you're talking about, let's say, liberation struggles, like a lot of things uh, only work here in the West. Once you move outside the West, then it's almost as if time stops. But for me, that's where art becomes important. Art, as I said, is about freedom. So it's constantly about how do we forge on in the world? How do we open up freedoms in places that we think that it might not possibly work, but it's a negotiation. Uh -huh. So you have to take the conditions that exist in those places, the sensitivity and everything, and then you have to work along with it. Fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much for that explanation. And it broadened my understanding of art, which it's probably a little bit shameful because my mother is an artist <laughs> and so is my sister. But that was a very beautiful, eloquent and uh, broad explanation. And it also pointed out how incredibly powerful and impactful art is and can be, especially, as you say, in times and places where normally maybe you don't have freedom yes. of speech and you cannot say things outright. Mm -hmm but you're more likely to be able to create an artistic creation that speaks for itself. Yeah, it, it is. But for me, when I think about it, it's not so much about the artist. It's about the impact of the artist's work, like the thinking that the artist brings into any given society and how that can create room for people to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not so much always about the voice and the vocal. It's always about position. Because it's so much for me, it's not so much about what you say. It's about what the impact of what you produce and what it means in any given time. Can you predict the impact that you're going to have when you're creating something? There are some things that you can predict, but some things you cannot also predict because we're dealing with time here. And the problem with humanity is that we're somehow bound by the mortality of our bodies. So we can only think in relation to the next 50 years, the next 70 years, if we're lucky, the next 100 years when we live. But the universe in itself is timeless and it's bound by billions of years and things like that. So the impact of what we do, it has to accumulate. Like I always tell, I always tell people that when you are born <clears throat> and you're growing up, you have to imagine that everything that has happened in the universe in all these billions of years, the, if you only you only have 70 years to live as a human being, you have to imagine that all those years, you have to compress it into your lifetime. Mm. So whatever you do within those 70 years, it has to be impactful because you only have 70 years as a gains even 4.5 billion years of the earth. So that's a big responsibility. You can't come and then mess it up because that's what humanity has always done. We're so arrogant in our ways because we've not existed. We're the youngest species on the planet and yet the most destructive. Because we think that there is our form of intelligence is the highest and it surpasses because we colonize everything. We, in fact, we colonize each other. We exploit each other. We exploit the earth, you know. <clears throat> Whereas there is no other species that is capable of that. They only take care of themselves, sustain their communities, things like that. So uh, the, the idea of being a human being already comes with a good, a big destructive force. Mm. So the idea is that if you're living, you ask yourself, how do I make how do I affect changes within that? Yeah. Mm, absolutely. So it's a great responsibility. No pressure, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into your background. Mm. I, I read upon and I, I watched a lot about your kind of professional career developments over the years. But how, for example, were the first uh, moments of your life? How was your childhood? Um, it's interesting. You know, when I was a child... Um, so I come from a big polygamous family. My father has four wives, um, many kids. Um, I was born in the north of Ghana, and we moved south to Accra. So I grew up my entire life in the capital. I went to various schools, but at the age of five, I was sent to a boarding school. So my siblings and I, we went to these boarding schools, but they were older, obviously. And then I spent one time, like one, six years, in this particular boarding school called St. John's Preparatory School. 
So it, of course, it was very shaping. It really shaped my life in terms of like the ideas of independence, things like that. Because mm. when you're at the age of five and you have to go away from your parents and be in a boarding school, that could be very difficult. It's young. Yeah, <laughs> that's very difficult. Yeah, and yeah, it's um, I. It was always tough for me. So I used to cry a lot. Uh, yeah, you know one of those Tom and Jerry cartoons when they're crying in the fountain. Yeah, I used to cry like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very bad, but I found peace in in drawing. I used to draw a lot because in, I used to make cartoon drawings, things like that. And then when I was going to high school, my family thought I had some kind of promise in that because I used to draw quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And they said, why not try studying art or something like that? And I went in that direction and I never looked back. So mm-hmm. for some reason, I always believed that my childhood trauma the idea of being away from family and being at boarding school was also that gift. Well, that's where the gift of my life beyond mm. came from. Because if I hadn't gone to a boarding school and I'd gone to different schools, I don't think I would have developed that same passion for art or drawing this, the same way I did have for it when mm. I was younger. Yeah. Interesting. So how, you know, a typical maybe adversity is actually turned into... An opportunity. I, I always love how to hear those stories and how different people, whether go that route or not really. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how was the artistic scene at the time in Ghana when you were growing up? Were there any artists that you were looking up to that were inspiring to you? Was there, um, let's say, a career trajectory as a path for artists at the time? Well, I didn't have any real um, idea of what I wanted to do with my practice up until when I went to uni. Even in university, I did not really think that I was going to become an artist. Of course, I did like making art and all that. It was when I started my master's, my MFA in 2011, that's when I began to think, okay, maybe I will take art as a as a career path. Um, yeah. Of course, in undergrad, by the time, like when I was in primary school, we went to the art center. There is this cultural center all across Ghana. It's called the Center for National Culture. Uh, I think it was born in the 70s or something like that. And um, you can go there as a tourist to buy artifacts when you're traveling, touristic things. But you also have like local painters who sell things, their crafts and all these other things. I did <clears throat> uh, my nas- uh, industrial attachment when I was in university in one of these places in the north. When I was younger, I went to one of them. I think when I was eight years old, there was a play by a school, the Presbyterian Boys, and it was really impactful. It really touched me. So I, when I was a child, I was in the drama group in the school, mm. in all the, like I always was always in the drama group. Even when I went to the university, I was in the drama group. We used to go around different schools performing for schools and all that. I liked the idea of being on stage, not because I felt I wasn't a good actor, but I liked the idea of the craft of it, you know. Mm. Um, and it also helped me in terms of like being articulate, being in front of people, talking to people. Because when you're on stage, it's like you have to get it right. You're trying to pass across like a script or something. And yeah, it, it for me, it was kind of, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting in that regard. Mm. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that. Has there been any other pivotal moments that when you think back were very impactful in shaping your journey and ultimately taking you to where you are now? Um, Well, the art school that I went to in Ghana, it's one of the most, it's clearly the most important decision I made Mm. because I remember when I was in high school about to go to um, uni, I would always say to my father, maybe it's better I go and study abroad because maybe abroad I can, yeah, that's where art is happening, Mm. blah, 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 because in Ghana, you could barely go for exhibitions. There were few, there were almost zero. There was there were almost zero institutions at the time. We had our national museum, which was built, being built in the sixties, completely abandoned since nineteen sixty six till date. Uh, they, of course, they use it, but the impact that the building could have had and what the content of it and everything, you always think that it's underwhelming and all that. <clears throat> um, of course, we've had various artists across different generations who've done incredible things. But of course, at the same time, we always felt that there was a lot more potential that was there. And for us, the potential was where we started from, the idea of like coming from this crisis. So when I was in university, 
in Ghana, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, I met this group of professors who were trying to radicalize the program, mm. led by my mentor, Dr. Karika Tasedu, and there were also other young artists like Bernard Akwe Jackson and all that at the time. So there were people that we used to look up to in terms of, oh, maybe one day we would want to be artists, maybe because these guys, they are really pushing, they are trying to show us the way, things like that. And <clears throat> there was a strong community around that. So the more I practiced, the more I thought about maybe if I could become an artist, it was always based from that point of view to think that we could actually do something that could be more impactful than what we anticipated it to be. Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to create something or phenomenon that never existed before. And for us, that was the starting point. We don't want to practice or do things because we know what it will become but we, we are doing it because of what poten the potentials that can be born out of it. And today you go to Ghana and realize that there's so many young artists who've been born out of this uh, last two decades based on like teachings and mentorship and things like that. And it's really radicalized the, the art scene. Mm. Yeah. What would you say is your purpose? My purpose? <laughs> I wonder if I have a purpose, honestly. Yeah, because sometimes I think like, hmm. I even question myself sometimes based on some of the things I do, decisions I make and all that. Yeah. For me, I think that uh, when we are all born in this world, there is a simple question that we have to ask ourselves. Why are we here? As I said before, yeah. we are here for such a short time. So <clears throat> if you're going to, if you know that you're going to live only 50 years on earth and you have, for instance, 30 active years or 25 active years, what do you do with those 25 years? And for me, it's very important. So I always ask myself, you always have to realize that you are always born in a position where you you are much better than other people, position-wise. So if you wake up every day, like as artists, sometimes we always complain. We're somehow ungrateful, you know. Like we're like, ah, oh, when I was I flew uh, when I flew from uh, uh, Ghana to London, and I went to. Uh, the United States and I went to Mexico, I had problems at the airports, they, they were racist, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yes, we understand. These are problems we have to deal with. But do you understand that there are so many people, there are at least 70% of the world's population who don't go anywhere. They're just mm. stuck places they are born. <laughs> so yeah. there you have to realize that you're already in a privileged position. You're already in a place, even though you're black, you're already in a place where there are even a lot of whites, Americans and others who never go anywhere. They are not even in a position where they want to go somewhere. People don't even want them where they go because they have nothing to okay. offer, nothing to give. Yeah. So when you're an artist, you realize that there is a consciousness or there is something that you come with that people always want. The same way, maybe if it's different from if you're a businessman or anything where you're going to places because you have to do business. But as an artist, you realize that there is something that you, a position that you have that the world needs. You know, so that is already in a privilege in itself. So th that's always been my thing. I always ask myself, okay, how do you share this with the rest of the world? Yeah, mm. so how do you share that? That's a question. And for me, that's the question I've been asking myself all this time. Do you share that through exhibitions, like going to Saudi to do like land, land art? Mm. Uh, do you go to places to teach? Like I wake up and I say, oh, I want to go to India. I want to teach in the school, blah, blah, blah. Because you realize that there is a position that you have. Like if I come to London, I say, oh, I want to give a lecture in this school, that school, that school. There's always a position that you come with that no matter how much someone is from here, if they're born into all the money in the world, they'll never have that position. Because mm -hmm. every place that we come from in the world, whether it's someone, you might have like the most incredible artists coming from Palestine right now because they have a position that they've seen the world from that none of us could ever see. That's and true. that's where art becomes important. The idea that you come to the world with a position that changes our sensibility. We listen, we watch, we, we either to performance, the senses, poetry, whatever, and we're like, wow, like the world, we didn't see the world from this position because we're so limited in, our, in ourselves in that way. So for me, those are, yeah, yeah it's, it's quite interesting trying to like negotiate around these. Principles. So in a way, what I'm understanding that you're saying is that your purpose is using to the best of your ability, your privileges, your blessings, the position that you've been yeah. given in this world to contribute, to give back and how you can do that best. In a way, it's a journey of that. Yes, it's a journey and it's okay. a question that you, it's, it's not that there is no permanent solution to it. It's a constant question that you're asking yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a constant iteration. Yeah.
I want to talk about your art. So these massive installations, you're very famous for many arts, but this is one specific thing that, you know, might pop into people's minds when they hear your name. So you're transforming monumental buildings by draping them in fabric that's made out of these stitched jute bags that used to hold um, cocoa beans or other commodities. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at this uh, interview of yours where you were explaining that, what came to my mind I smiled because I remember these times when I, as a younger uh, kid, went into museums and Mm -hmm. exhibitions places. And especially when I saw modern art, Mm -hmm. I literally this one time I went into this hall and it had a huge pile of trash. And I was like, (laughs) are you joking? Is this art? And I was like, I just simply don't get it. Let me let me not go to this museum anymore because I don't get it. And so what I'm saying is it's only when you complement the artwork with the explanation of the meaning from the artist Mm -hmm. that it's like you click and the lamp turns on Mm -hmm. otherwise you're in the darkness Mm -hmm. so with Mm -hmm. this analogy could you please explain to people what is the meaning of this draping of these huge monumental buildings across the globe in these jute bags Thank you. Yeah, that is interesting the way you put it. Yeah, I think that's always a question that people see objects, the same things they're familiar with all the time. And they see it in the museum. It's like, ah, I have one of this at home. What is this? (laughs) Yeah, but it's also because every object has its own life. And the way we use it, it accumulates its own memories and all that. The way we are born out of the universe is the same way every element, every atom the neutron, whatever, it's all embedded within these objects and all that. When they, they, uh, If we're going to follow the theory of the Big Bang, when the universe was born into place, all the like the gold, the diamond, everything was born out of that. Our DNA, everything was born out of that, you know? So at the end of the day, we have to understand that even when we produce things, those things have their own life, just that they have their own DNA as we do have. Yes, that our interventions changes the way that they are. And because we're a, a, pl- we're a species of uh, high consumption, we consume, we discard, we consume. We dis- so our whole mentality is about that. We discard and we're like, ah, but this thing is no longer useful. Let's mm. throw it away. But what you're forgetting that that thing has its own life. Yeah, you've already abused it by taking it from its raw form and converting it into an object or whatever. So for me, the question is that all this process that has been through, how do we... How do we look at it? And that's where I became interested in these jute bags because mm-hmm. these jute bags are traditionally made in India and in Bangladesh. And you know uh, the history of colonialism in relation to the British and all that, the partition of India. So for me, that became very important to look at, to start with. Uh, these bags are brought into Ghana and then they're used mostly for transportation of cocoa. You know, cocoa was the number one cash crop in Ghana, our highest GDP grocer uh, in the 20th century. So a lot of like early infrastructure post-independence were made, were built out of the money that was made from cocoa. Um, Students were educated with cocoa scholarships like uh, Mm -hmm. uh, selling cocoa. And back in post-independence, 1957, our first president, the idea was that he was a Pan-Africanist in Kruma, and the idea was to build these series of industries that would somehow help to economic liberation, economic independence and all that. Because before, prior to that, everything the British were, it was an extractive economy. But then he was also afraid of what could happen in a post-independence scenario. The idea that you could have this kind of uh, 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 neo-colonial uh, 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 moment, and which did happen, of course. But the bags that we're using in Ghana were traditionally were not meant to use because the idea was that we were supposed to build these superstructures concrete buildings that they would store these commodities in. Mm. They would sell them to an international markets on our own terms, uh, the continent as a whole. And then, yeah, farmers would make more money. People would have more money. Uh, uh, people would have more money. People would, education would build more schools to do that. None of that happened, you know. Of course, mm. of course, World Bank, IMF interventions in like the global south, it changed quite a lot of things. A lot of these buildings were privatized. So now it's better to import these materials from another country because the contractors make a lot of money. It comes, they put the beans in it, the beans are sent off to Europe. 
So they'll send their cocoa beans to Switzerland or other places. They'll brand the bag Ghana Cocoa Board Produce of Ghana. And the government is the only entity that is allowed to buy cocoa and trade it internationally. You know, we don't have processing plants, so we sell everything raw. So the farmers don't make enough money from it. So some of them end up having more children to help them in their farms. So at the end of the day, you have like a, a what's the name? A, a, is it fair? Yeah, there's a fair trade. Fair trade. The idea that oh, we're not using like child labor yeah. in these beans, but it's a, it's an economic problem. If you solve that, you would not have that problem. If uh, countries were had their own will to be able to process and things like that, do if, if certainly make more money. So what happens that at the end of the year you have let's say the chocolate industry around the world making let's say almost two hundred billion dollars from selling cocoa, all kinds I read of products. That, yeah. But between Ghana and Ivory Coast, that produces let's say about seventy percent of the world's beans. Both countries don't even make up to two or three billion dollars. So then, what happens to the one hundred and ninety something billion dollars? Exactly. It comes back in the form of NGOs. Uh, like the surplus capital. Oh, yeah, we have to teach the farmers how to uh, the birth control, don't have many children, or oh, you, uh, you have to use these kind of fertilizers, blah, blah, blah. And those fertilizers also, they kill the soil at the end of the day because they are not, eventually, maybe it helps in the crop yields within that period, but eventually it destroys the land because the land is not used to that. So they, all these things are embedded within this material that I'm working with. Mm. So at the end of the day, if I take a bag and I said, okay, fine, this bag has been used for cocoa. Now it is being used to transport, let's say, rice, maize. It's gone across borders. Women have written their names on it. The bag is beginning to accumulate memory. For me, the fact that the bag has been discarded once after being used for cocoa, which is on the international market, and now it's been discarded. And then all these local women who are like farming, like local things that we consume locally, which the world doesn't really care so much about. When we're beginning to con uh, consume these things, that the bag is now a vessel and a container of, the bag begins to live, for me, in my opinion, even more than it was mm -hmm. when it was used just once. It's like when you have a shirt that you wear so many times that you become so attached to it, you know, and then you have one that shirt that is in your closet that you're even afraid to touch each time. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, I only wear this to special occasions. For me, it's very, it's much harder to discard a shirt that I've worn for like, for a long time because there is a soul you feel like there's a part of your soul in it and that's how come that's how i feel about these objects because each and every one of them have these souls embedded within them and then when we begin to bring put them together artistically sewing them and then draping buildings with them i feel like there is a dialogue or relationship between the architecture and then these material because now it's one bag like this and you're putting thousands together and normally this bag is just supposed to contain something small in a moment. And now you're putting it in such a way that it covers an entire building. So what happens, what's the relationship now? Because now this bag was supposed to contain something very little. And now you've made it in such a way that it covers the entire world. Mm -hmm. So our relationship to that simple, insignificant object, which we don't know what we're thinking of. Suddenly you see it and it's overwhelming. Like, wow, like, how, did, how is this possible? You begin to think. But... All the house, and that's where, for me, again, art becomes interesting. Because the art noun is that, how, how is this possible? One, from an ideological mm -hmm. perspective, and two, also from an artistic perspective. How was it made? Who made it? Uh, how are you seeing it? The palette, the palette, the visuals, the sound that it makes, even your own relationship to it. Yeah, so there are so many readings and meanings that one can make out of these uh, interventions. Fascinating. Yeah. I will use that word once more. <laughs> and it's only not until you speak to somebody that created that, that they can show you and broaden your perspective and show you all the many ways that you can actually look at this object. So it's very valuable, again, to have you actually explain that. And I'm kind of following your story and it sounds like it's a beautiful relationship because you are covering these buildings that were partially funded by these cocoa beans mm -hmm. that these bags contained and you are reminding the world where in fact this funding came from <laughs> partially 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 <laughs> um but also on another note it just sounds like you are giving something more so once they were the beans <laughs> and now it's the discard let's say discarded material byproduct of this being cocoa production 
And then once more, you found another use to it, and then you're giving it back to the Western world. <laughs> so you're, 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 you're creating another edition, if that makes sense. No, it does, certainly. Because again, you also have to think that when in my practice back at home, like the idea of building these institutions, all of that has been born out of the idea of using these materials, discarded materials, to, for instance, produce um, uh, works which institutions in the West collect mm -hmm. for their collections, for public viewing and all that. And then the residue, which is the capital, the money, I use in building new spaces in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And in those new spaces, kids can, for instance, learn about coding, about technology, about history, mm -hmm. their own history, something that was a cutaway. So for instance, one interesting example is that one of these buildings that was built back then to contain these cocoa beans, a lot of them were abandoned uh, during the structural adjustment program when the IMF and World Bank was beginning to bail out countries, giving them loans, things like that. The conditions were that they would um, privatize certain state institutions because they were redundant. There is no point of like having all these state institutions when you don't have money to like take care of them or to employ people, things like that. So um, a number of these institutions were privatized. And I bought one of them in COVID period in 2000, a building that was going to be destroyed. And I bought it and I converted it into an art center. Mm -hmm. But the building was, um, um, was populated by uh, bats and other ecosystems and all that. And I thought it, this was brilliant. Why not leave it? Because mm. at the time, COVID, everyone was saying that, oh, but the bats are the ones that are giving us. The bad us guys, yeah. The bad guys. And I was like, no, humanity is, we are the problem. Not no one. We are the problem of all of this. You know, in, we are self-destructive in that way. So we cannot blame all these other species for the problems that we have mm. uh, now. So I decided to leave the bats in it so in such a way that we could cohabit with them in terms of even interventions, how we could relate to them in those in the architecture and all that. And I, the money that I used in buying the building was money that I got from selling these jute sack works, mm. which were the, the, the content, which were the beans were once supposed to be in these buildings and it wasn't. So it left this void in the building, but a void also allowed for the ecosystem to flourish within it over half a decade. And from 1966 to 2020, uh, yeah, 2020, when COVID happened, within that period, imagine the number of uh, like uh, living organisms, ecosystems in the world that have gone extinct mm. because of humanity's destructive force. Yeah, all the species that have gone almost extinct is because of hunting activities, mm. climate change, blah, blah, blah. So then, we are looking at a timeline where there's been like a huge destructive crisis happening and we barely think about it. But at the same time, you go into a building and realize that there are bats, there are snails, there are all these things, there are bird nests. And Nature then, reclaiming yes, its Yes, exactly. And then for once, that is a chance for you to think and be like, okay, maybe this is a time to rethink about our relationship. But for a lot of people, it's very... They're like, oh, yeah, let's get rid of them. Because the, the first thing about human beings is always to colonize, to mm. think that, oh, yeah, we are in charge. But I said, no, let's pause. Let's think about this. Let's leave the bats in this building. And then let's see how we can cohabit with them, how it can also teach us about ways in which we can use the space. Because the void is like uh, delving into the grand cosmos of the universe and going through like wormholes and other things and realizing that there are ideas of time, of physics, of anything that we never even had any idea of. And for me, I think that that is where um, yeah, that the residue, the idea of the residue, which is like money, money can want money is one of those residues, but it's also political and scientific, archaeological residue. All these things are there that the artists can also borrow. Mm. And for me, anything aside economic, that also has to deal with like ideological and everything. We can borrow that or we can use that in order to be able to change the positions that we hold in this world. Mm, I love that. And I love how you're really adopting this mindset of circularity where it's exactly the opposite of what is the mainstream mm -hmm. still uh, thought of process, which is uh, new is always better. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's old and it's worn out, then it's time to throw it out. Mm -hmm. So it's very much the opposite. And you're just finding ways to breathe in new life into old objects to transform these derelict buildings and what others might call trash and something that they want to dispose of, potentially also contributing, you know, some carbon emissions mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and other, you know, negative impacts for the environment. You're finding a way to not only save them, but you're also finding a way to add value to them. 
uh, both economic value and artistic value that then goes on to inspire, you know, the newer generations, the communities around you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really powerful. And I guess my question then is, what needs to change in people's mindset for more people to adopt that way of thinking, especially in African countries where that's most needed? Yeah, I guess it's uh, it comes down to the question of education also again. Yeah, I think the idea is that we need to be able to invest into more institutions that are more uh, politically sensitive. Um, not really so much politically correct, but politically sensitive. Um, and also that's, yeah, is always willing to relearn, reteach itself. Um, expand its own views and then also willing to take the views of others um yeah in a way it's a collective thing at the end of the day even when you have like a school the idea is not that you have a school where you have all the knowledge and then you give to the students or things like that the idea is that you create a series of constellations that allows both parties to always learn mm -hmm. even the entity itself has to relearn itself it's like it has to change its form its position and things like that so for me that is uh, one education certainly I think it's one of the most important things that we have to reevaluate and one thing that can change the world, the perspectives mm. that it comes with. Imagine like you look at America as a country and then you have like characters like Trump, others, of course, not to say the alternative is also <laughs> like the best, but again, um, you like you ask yourself, like this is one of the greatest countries on earth, you know, but when each time there's a crisis situation and you realize the position that they take to things, like particularly even with this, uh, uh, Palestine Israel situation I'm like what is happening here mm. like this is supposed to we're supposed to have some of the greatest minds in this place but how is it that they're making these kind of uh, political decisions so education is very important it's also the sensitivity that it comes with again life paramount to everything the idea that once we begin to understand that every life matters and is important we don't respect the earth to begin with we're fracking they're fracking in America they're uh, like their people are dying in the hospitals because they cannot pay their medical bills. Mm. Like, so at the end of the day, how do you expect them to care about um, wars in other places where at the end of the day, they might even benefit from in the end. So for me, I think that it's very important that we have to, society as a whole, collectively, we have to understand that we hold each other. We, we are responsible for each other mm. and whatever. It's like being in a traditional society. And I think that, the indigenous uh, cultures, like maybe the Native Americans, and um, if you went to an indigenous society, you realize that people were responsible for each other. My problem was your problem, mm. was the next our neighbor's problem and all that. We would farm together, we'll help each other. And that's how you solve the problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whereas now, it's about, it's, a, it's about power. It's about showing you that, yes, I do have one thing that you don't have. Why not invest more money into building nuclear weapons? Why? And I'm like, yeah, but you why not invest money into healthcare and education and things like that? So I think it's one of the, uh, we have different, of course, the world has created its own problems and then there are so many insecurities and constantly it's like we've created a monster that we have to feed, we have to feed, we have to feed. And it's certainly not getting us anywhere. It's only creating a, a, a bigger moment of self-destruction in the future for a generation that has nothing to do with the, the time, the decisions that we're making right now. And for me, I think that we have to learn to be more sensitive. So education, again, we have to really look at it very well. And obviously you're doing your contributions with all the institutions that you've opened. I saw this wonderful interview uh, that you were having uh, with a class of kids. Yeah. And that's actually where I got my first question because you asked <laughs> them to the kids, you were like, what is art? Arts, and yes. so, yeah, I, I like that very much. So. Yeah. We've spoken about a lot of ideas that you've had and you've put them, you know, you've, you've breathed life into them. Mm -hmm. So how do you get your ideas? Mm -hmm. That's an important question. Maybe that's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> Trade no. secret cannot no. discuss. <laughs> no, certainly not a secret. Yeah, but ideas are all around us, mm. you know. And I've always said that, look, ideas don't come to everyone. And then when you decide that you're going to do something with your life and you, you invest your time into it, the more you spend time on it, you're reading on it, you're, when you're walking in the streets, you're paying attention to things, 
was like either being a comedian, like comedians get a lot of ideas from like everyday life mm. things. Like even when they're talking to people, I like comedians who make comedy from just their regular life things that they've seen and how they take notice. And we laugh about it because we're like, oh it's yeah, relatable. Like, it's relatable, you know. Um, th- that is one thing. And this uh, Trevor Noah is a very great example of that. Uh, Dave Chappelle, uh, Steve Stewart, like uh, John Stewart and many others, like just the regular things. And it's the same thing when it comes to art. You know, at the end of the day, you even scientists, like um, mathematicians, people like that, engineers and all that, you're paying attention to the regular things every day. And then you're trying to imagine, oh, what could it be, blah, blah, blah. And then one time you realize that, oh, you see something and it you merge it with another thing that you experience or saw, then it, it becomes like a fabric that you can play with. You're like, okay, what if I combine this with that thing? And what would it be? So ideas are all around us, mm. but just as sometimes things come to us and then we're like, ah, man, this is ridiculous. I'm like, like, it's the same way like when you're a child and you went to the modern arts museum and you saw the object and like, oh, what trash is this? The moment <laughs> you see anything, like if you come to my studio or if you see the kind of works I've made all these years, some of them you'd always imagine how, like, why did you even make this? How did you even collect this? The ideas that I don't dismiss anything I see. For me, anything has, but everything has potential. Everything has its own potential, but it's a matter of how do we unearth that potential, Mm. you know? So when an idea comes to you and you dismiss it, and another one comes and you dismiss it, trust me, ideas will not come to you anymore. But when you do something with it, sometimes it, within that period, a work that might not be matured, it might be limited. You leave it for five years, and one time you come back to it and then suddenly it becomes, poof, it, it, it explodes. It becomes something that everyone sees like, wow, this is remarkable. But then it's because you invested silence period of like thinking about it, of going back to it, touching it, a bit changing its position over time. Because it, it's also about introspection because mm. you're dealing, it's an inward thing that you are trying to bring out to share with the rest of the world, you know? So that is, that is uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, so for me, ideas is all around us. There's a movie called, uh, what's that movie? Oh, oh, I've forgotten. There's a child who's like a genius at playing. Like he, 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 lis- he sees sound, he listens, mm-hmm. he, like he makes, he's able to bring different sounds together, collect sounds and all that. And at the end of the movie, the last thing that he sees that uh, it's all around us. You just have to listen, like music. Mm. <laughs> it's very, very, very true. You know, I like to say this one thing that, the wisdom Mm -hmm. i say the wisdom the intelligence is all around us Mm -hmm. so the question is how you as a human being can refine your antennas or clear your channel if you will whatever resonates better so that you can receive those ideas so you know the newton any other you know nobel prize winner (laughs) how how did they get the idea and so i completely agree with you the the ideas are all around us Mm -hmm. and what you added on there which is very important of course for anyone listening that's kind of asking themselves the same question about how do you get the ideas is you don't cut anything off you don't discredit you don't Mm -hmm. dismiss anything there's a reason why that idea popped into your head so yeah kind of uh, i guess harbor them nurture them see if they develop into something I wanted to, so you kind of answered my question. I wanted to ask you if there's like a specific process that you have when you take, you know, ideas from idea stage to a created work, uh, kind of step by step. Mm-hmm. Look, when I am home and I'm going through the city or anywhere, I see things like sometimes I'm driving maybe a 500 kilometer distance and on the, I see something and I stop. Then I go, I talk to the people, I look at it, then I take some pictures, I make some notes, I keep going. So maybe there's an object, I buy it, I, if it's possible, I keep it in a car, you take it back, you look at it, blah, blah, blah. Um, you come back to it again. You realize that there is a quality to it that it doesn't allow you to use it, but if you were to extend that quality into other things, it would be another phenomenon altogether. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's some of the process that I go through. You talk to people, so I don't rush in doing work because a lot of the work that I do, they're quite monumental and they require time. Yeah. In 2015, I made some f- pictures of a stadium in, the, in my region, the Tamale Sports Stadium, years ago. Um, and between that period and 2000 and, um, 
Yeah, most recently. Um, no, in COVID time, 2020, I went back there again and made some drone images of it again when I was working on the silo project, which was not far away. And I was always thinking how to intervene within this space. It was, it's just a space, like a stadium. So just looking at it from a drone's perspective and I perspective. Then last year, when I was commissioned by the Barbican to do this monumental piece for it, the, the stadium was the place I chose to use as a studio to produce this work, but also thinking about it in relation to like the same bird's eye view. Because later when you see the images, you realize that there are constellations of all these fabrics which are being sewn together, different mm -hmm. elements. So we're working with like 400, 500 women every day to sew this material together. So gradually you see the material transforming, like the pack, the pitch of the stadium. You see the, the, the poles, you see like different fabrics in different spaces. But then in 2015, I never really imagined that all this process of going back again, my relationship to the stadium, because I really don't go to the stadium that much. But each time I went there, I wasn't so much interested in being in the stadium. The idea of, was looking at the stadium from the outside. Mm -hmm. So once the element of like sewing and other things came into it, I asked myself, can you bring this element of sewing? Because the people who sew, no one goes to the stadium to go in. So you go to watch a football match. But I asked myself, what happens if we fill up the stadium with these sewers and they're trying to sew within the same pitch that the football is being kicked around? But this time, and it's an extremely slow process. Mm. That is where I thought that I thought it was. That's where poetry, the poetry of it, started. It's because now it's becoming a bit ridiculous. You're like, uh, but no one does this in the world. It doesn't make any sense. It's an open space. It can rain at any time. Mm. This can happen. That all the constellation. But that's where it becomes interesting. Then you're thinking, okay, when I do it in this way, and this happens, and that happens, it opens up this paradigm, and that exactly. Mm. Wow. This is this is why you need to ask the author about the <laughs> ideas because one would never ever know. So speaking about artists and of course artists uh, questions and mm -hmm. aspirations, do you have first of all any advice for starting or up and coming artists in general? Yeah, I guess it's a matter of identifying what you want to do and staying true to it. Mm. Um, a lot of people want to do things, but they don't know the direction. It's about the direction. And also, I think that in most cases, most people start, because if you're an artist, there are different types of artists, I always say. If you want to become an artist, you can either become an artist that is of global recognition and significance where you can do this and that. You can impact people from all around the corners. Or you can just be an artist that produces work that is beautiful, that people want to buy and hang in their homes, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. There are different types of artists and artists that you can become. Sometimes you can be an artist that you, we can separate your work from your political ideology and everything. Whereas some artists, their work is the political ideology or mm -hmm. things like that. So first and um, first and foremost you have to ask yourself what kind of an artist do i want to be and what does what's the impact that i want my work to do or to have and then based on that you find people that you know that they align to your thinking mm. and if there's a possibility for them to mentor you why not you know, no matter how difficult these people could be you have to negotiate with them mm. everything in life is about negotiation you know mm. And um, yeah, and then you take it from there. But certainly you have to be patient. Patience is one of the key things. Yeah, to realize again, as I said in the beginning, that we as artists are extremely privileged in ways that even if we think that our life is precarious because we don't make enough money or whatever, but we hold views in the world that most people in the world can barely think about mm. because most people just live in the world. They want to have kids. They want to uh, have a good house. They want to die. But as, as, as an artist, that is not our priority. To begin with our priority is that how do we deal with the constellation of life mm. you know so if you're an artist then if you're using that as a starting point then now you have to find the people around you who a community where you can become a part of who can also lead you within that uh within so mentorship is very yeah, mentorship, is mentorship very, and patience yeah. absolutely so is there a way or advice that you'd say for somebody as an artist that they can stand out because of course you know, by definition, as an artist, you should be creating something original, mm -hmm. but the road is very daunting and very long. So <laughs> if somebody is. is like, well, I want to be really different, I want to be noticed, what would you tell them? Uh, well, I think it just doesn't come mm -hmm. like that. But I also think you have to invest a lot of time in your craft. Yeah, you have to... 
respects the crafts that you find yourself in, even to begin with, I imagine. So if you're doing something, it could be drawing or whatever, and you realize that there is a, there is a subject matter that maybe might not be too popular mm. to touch upon, that you think that that is you can do something with it which can actually change the way we think about art or the history of things and all that. Why not? It all starts with a risk. Mm. Art always starts with a risk, with crisis. And then born out of that crisis, the rest of the world is able to share within it. Yeah, so certainly I think that uh, as an artist, we have to be willing to take like big risk, particularly with regards to how you produce your work, subject matter, advice and everything. Mm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing as well is you're saying that a person has to be very, very authentic, very vulnerable and be able to go down paths that, you know, a conventional person would never. Exactly. That's literally the, the, the job of the artist. Yeah. Yes. Vulnerability is very important mm -hmm. when you're doing art. It's not, art is not a macho thing. It's not about showing that, yeah, I'm great, like in many things. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wonderful, I can do this. No, it's about showing that, no, this is hard, this is difficult. The, the, what I'm doing is actually, because most processes that artists use, it's like, Sometimes it's 50-50. It could work, it could not work. But then when it works, then we all see it and we're like, wow. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So when you see that, then you're like, oh, wow, like this is so beautiful. Then we go through the process and like, oh, the artist had to use resin, had to use this. Like when I just came from uh, Lula right now, there was one of the artists work, a seal, where she makes these uh, resin uh, sculpture. They were cast in 3D and like, uh, and then they had to pour this resin on it. It, when you see it, it's sometimes difficult to notice it because it looks just like the rocks, mm. the, the canyons there with all the pattern. It's incredible, you know. And then when you see it just like that, it's very difficult to know what the process. But because I was there and it was just a few meters away from where my work was. So every day I would see in the process of them making it. I talked to even the guy. There was one British guy who came from here to... He was a resin expert. There's a company here. They mix the resin and they do the pouring and everything. And they have to do it over days and days and days. So each time I see it, I see in the process and everything. So my relationship to the work is very different. I just don't see it as a beautiful thing. I see it as something. It's almost like I witnessed the birth of the universe yeah. <laughs> or the earth in that way. And I think that's where, yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that, the, the vulnerability within that, because that could have gone any way. Yeah, but the fact that they were able to manage that chaos as difficult as it was the technique. And then now we see it and we're like, wow, like this is incredible. But then if you could go back in time, anything could have happened because they only had one chance to get it right. <laughs> so from that perspective, I'm, I'm almost hearing that, yes, the artwork is, of course, the finished mm -hmm. product, as you say, but equally, if not more, the artwork is also the artistic journey that went from, from zero to 100 exactly. to the finished product. So I guess I have a question. Shouldn't it be a good idea to somehow share or display the creating process of most artworks? I think artists, some artists do that through either giving lectures on their work or whatever. Uh, but I think that in most cases, people are obsessed with the products. You know, mm. that's the world that we live in. So, so you say they wouldn't care? Some artists don't really care about it. Some do. Some are focused on the process because the, it's the process of making something that's where politics becomes important. Mm. That's where our relationship to things or the relationship between things become important. So in that case, it becomes like uh, extremely significant to pay attention to. Um, yeah, so I guess it's one of those things that you have to decide what you pay attention to, mm -hmm. whether you pay attention to the final stage of anything, or you pay attention to how the thing is made. And for me, I think that the, how something is made is very important mm. because at that point, when you pay attention to all the, how it's made, you realize that it could have, the end product is one part and you could have had alternatives. Yeah. It, many other <laughs> things could have also been born out of it. So then you begin to, uh, you speculate on other potentials. Yeah. And for me, those potentials are, that's what drives you as an artist. Then you think, Okay, when I finished the work, it became this. But then if I had done one of this or that, it could have become this. So that's why... It, the when butterfly you look at, effect. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, as an artist, you realize that one, uh, like for me, I've, I have one idea that I'm working with, but then I can show you that same idea in a thousand different folds. Mm. Because each time I go back to the original idea, based on experience I have, and I'm like, okay, fine, I could change in this direction. Okay, I didn't consider sound. 
I didn't consider this color. I didn't consider this element. I didn't consider smell. I didn't consider maybe the heaviness of the objects in relation to this. So the more you begin to think about it, the more you realize there's just one single idea, but then you begin to unfold it in many different forms. Mm. Yeah. Infinite possibilities. Infinite possibilities. It's like the jute sack. The, the, the ideas I'm dealing with them in relation to time, what we we're talking about earlier on, it's the same thing that is reflected in the piece in Alula, working with pots that are used for water and then they are repaired and then you see the cracks, the skin, the same as the skin of the bag, the content, you take it, there's no water in it, you subvert it on the desert, the relationship between the desert and the sand. Because when I was in Saudi, I realized, you know the thing, we ask many people, what life can you find in the desert? Most people tell that there's no life in the desert. Mm. But then the desert has more life than anything you can possibly imagine. Mm. Life is not so much about, because when people think about the desert, they think about it in relation to human life. Mm. If you found yourself in the desert, you die because there's no water. But then does it mean there's no life in the desert? It's just in relation to your inconsequential life. Of course. Yes. But then the desert has its own life, you know? So then my question is that if you go to this, uh, to Alula, the rocks that are there, a lot of them are almost a billion years old. They've been forming for so long, some of them before Pangaea, before the mm. earth split and everything. And then the new continents were born and things like that. So if you're bringing, let's say, an object into that space, even though maybe one might say that if you go to a desert, there is no life and everything, you have to realize that where you are standing, it's like a, almost 900 and something to a billion years old. In comparison to human life, it's, it's our life is in the cradle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So now there's a question of now you have to humble yourself and deal with the question of life in itself. Mm. So if you're bringing objects in this space, you have to look at that history, that's the formation and everything, how that can influence the work that you produce. Yeah. You know what? It really resonated what you just said because this is, I think about this when I think about religion and how, mm -hmm. for example, when people talk about hell and heaven mm -hmm. or deities or, or God himself, it's everything is so personalized, catering mm -hmm. to human mm -hmm. ideas of how humans look and <laughs> what we would like and how we live. And so they have human bodies, and yes, human hair. And it always, <laughs> since I can remember, I always just thought like, with all the possible life forms, energy forms, multi-dimensional expressions <laughs> that an entity could take, why would they be exactly like us? Exactly. It, just, it just doesn't make sense as soon as you think about it, at least in my opinion. So it, yeah, it really yeah. makes sense what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but going back to uh, going back to helping the new artists, yeah. a really important part, of course, in the in the longevity of uh, one's artistic pursuit is mm -hmm. the finances. Mm -hmm. So. Can you comment on or advise or share anything relevant that you think might help an artist figure out their financials when it comes to art? How can that be the main business? How can you make money doing art um, so that you don't have to resort on doing like five part-time jobs and then you don't have any time for art? Yeah. Well, I guess, again, it comes down to the question of commitment. Mm. So then if you commit yourself enough to the work that you're doing, you develop it in a way. Some artists make a lot of money, some don't. The question is not so much about making so much money. The question is that can the work sustain you? And does it make you happy? Does it keep you happy? Some artists make so much money, unnecessary money, that they don't. no one even needs that kind of money. But at the end of the day, you ask yourself, what do those artists do with those monies? Nothing. They just keep mm -hmm. the money in their account. Mm -hmm. They're like businessmen. The, the money is like a reward for what they've done, for their geniusness or whatever. But mind you, the fact that you make a lot of money from your work doesn't really mean that you're a genius. Yeah, you know, so there are some artists, some of the greatest artists who ever lived who made work. They never really made much money from their work. Maybe they made enough to survive. But then later on, of course, tons of money was made out of their mm. work and all that. It's good that whilst you're alive, you're able to make money. But then that's not the ultimate thing. I think that um, for me, when I started working, I would earn money here and there from teaching, uh, giving lectures on my work, from selling a work, things like that. Those monies were enough for me to like, have live a very decent life. I could have moved anywhere in the world. I could have bought apartments in almost every city. But then I asked myself, what do I really want to do? And I said, okay, maybe the best thing might be to build, uh, what's the name? To build an institution. Mm -hmm. And that institution can turn the, the tides of time. It can allow for children who never had any relationship to art 
or culture in a different way or technology in a different way or history in a different way. So by using that money, it somehow created new, it mm. creates new forms, but also creates new problems. It means that now you need to earn more money in order to sustain this mm. or to expand it or whatever. But for me, that is where arts became more interesting. That idea that we decided that in we had managed to escape that precarity because I I I, I certainly make more money for, than any of my colleagues who maybe I studied, I grew up with or things like that. But at the end of the day, I almost don't have money all the time mm. because every money that I make, I put it back. Because when you're an artist, it's a bit precarious. As you said, you have to do several things sometimes to make things work. Mm. But what happens when you get to a point when you don't have to? Then you maybe only doing art, but then again, you, you invest everything about the art back into mm. the space or the world. And then it's it puts you in a precarious position. But then it opens up... Uh, it opens up uh, all these positions for people to experience the world in different ways. So the precarity, again, you might be precarious, but then the fact that you've sacrificed your luxury for the rest of the, the community around you opens up other possibilities also within your own mind. So for instance, you see things that happen or manifest through that, and then it gives you different ideas as to how you could do other things. And then that becomes also a success. And then you invest it to other things. So for me, it's that again, as I said, it's a negotiation. So as an artist, you can really sustain yourself from the work that you do. But for me, I've always imagined that when you do, when you manage to get to that point, the other question to again, like now, what, is do that, you do with it? what do you do with it? Mm. Do you sit on it? Or do you, it's not a, I don't like using the word gamble. It's not a gamble. Do you redistribute that mm. and see what and it how. manifests. And how, yeah, yes. absolutely. So I, I love that you say this. I, I had a, I led this vision board workshop yesterday and one of the areas, of course, very mm. important to everybody in everybody's mm. life is, you know, money, having mm-hmm. enough money mm-hmm. yes. to live the life that you want. And I specifically said to everyone that it's very important that they don't focus on, you know, specific idea of mm-hmm. the money itself, but rather focus on what it will transform into mm-hmm. when they have that. Because wanting money for money's sake brings nothing but mm-hmm. uh, infinite infinite desire, because mm-hmm. there's an infinite amount of money, yes. <laughs> of course. And also, it's it's a very empty desire because money in and of itself is nothing but a couple of zeros mm-hmm. or a piece of paper or mm-hmm. a piece of metal. Yeah. So what really one should focus on and envision and you know clarify at least their goals and desires around is what that money then turns into. Is it a foundation? Is it a house? Yes. Is it a garden? Is yes. it uh, your retired parents? Yeah. Is it you know you buying clothes that you yeah. love, traveling the world, whatever it is. Money is a conduit. Um, so you know how they also sometimes say, uh, you know, this the rich people are bad or, you know, these people are bad. <laughs> but money is just an amplifier, mm-hmm. you know. So if you were, uh, excuse me, an asshole, uh, before that, you're going to be a 10x one exactly. with, with 10x <laughs> money, right? Yeah, yeah, or exactly. if you're a really, really nice, generous person, you're just going to be 10x, you know, yes, more exactly. generous with, with yeah. the money that you, you have. You put it right because money... Sometimes only amplifies the person that you are. If mm. you're a terrible person and you make money, then you become a much more terrible person. Yes. <laughs> you become a monster. Mm. Yeah, but then you realize that people who want to share, even when they don't have, and then they make money. And then, of course, there are some cases where people are very humble and they get money and suddenly they become. But it's also the case where there's always that desire when I have money one day, I want to do this and that. But and then what? Yeah, exactly. And then what? Yeah. Yeah. So whilst we're on the topic of finances, I actually was curious how, in your case, for example, how do you make money? Is it that the cities pay you to make these amazing installations? And so obviously you're adding value. People are more mm-hmm. tourists and people are coming to see them. Or is it that, uh, you know, private collectors are um, buying your works or they're kind of ordering you to create an installation for <laughs> them? Or um, how, how does that work for you? So there are different things. So one, you make drawings, whatever, sculptures, that you work with galleries. Mm. You give these sculptures to the galleries on consignment. The galleries sell them. And then you make your money, your mm. part of the money. Uh, the other ones, you institutions commission you to do a work, and a project, and then they pay you a fee for the project. Mm. And then, like uh, the cities. Yes, mm-hmm. they pay you a fee for the project. And then sometimes you're lucky that someone wants to buy the work or part of the work. Things like that. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. With the huge... 
Yeah. Sometimes they want to buy a part of it. Ah. So those are possible also in situations. They're like, oh, yeah, we like this project, but can we get a part of it? They're like, oh, yeah, maybe I can make a site-specific work for you, and that would be the only time this work is ever made. You're the only one that has it. So the people are not buying the entire work, but they're buying their exclusivity to the work. Mm. So uh, th- 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 it might be a small thing. It might just be this, but then they might pay, let's say, 100000 or 200000 mm-hmm. for it. Because it's not based on the size of it. It's based on the rarity of it, the idea mm-hmm. that they own it now. Of course, they don't own the idea, but they own that specific moment in time in your practice mm-hmm. in terms of what you did. Yeah. So, or you go and teach a lecture, you give a lecture, and then they say, oh, we'll pay you $100, we'll pay you $200. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all these things come together. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you're like, okay, fine. This year I earned this and that and that. What do I do with it? <laughs> understood. Understood. And so these huge, uh, again, installations, I saw you had a beautiful one in Milan. How costly is it to actually produce that, to, to, to create that? Well, it depends. If you're producing a work from scratch, sometimes it can be quite expensive. Some of them could run into like uh, at least 50 70,000 euros. Mm. It depends on what the project is. Uh, but that is just a production from the artist studio. But you can also be looking at, for instance, some of the, pro- like I did this project in Germany recently, and the entire project cost almost half a million euros. <gasps> yeah. Not to say that the artist gets half a million of euros. Course, like the cost. The, the cost. So, for instance, maybe the production of the work costs, let's say, 50,000. Maybe the artist, your artist fee. Normally, the artist gets the lowest of all the mm. amount. The artist is paid, let's say, ten thousand for the work, for the for his labor into the work. Maybe you have some assistance. They're paid so so and so x amount, and then now the money goes into transportation, into mm. installation costs. They need architects, they need engineers, they need per- planning permissions. So by the time everything is done, you realize that maybe half a million has gone into the pro- wow. publication. Blah blah blah. So it's an entire system, mm. you know. So even that work, I remember what happened. The city, you know, it's it was it's a German city where, you know, they used to have all these big shopping arcades and all that. And people would go and do shopping, things like that. That culture is dying now because of Amazon and all that, because people really don't need, there's e-commerce, people don't need to go to a shop, things like that. So a lot of buildings are being closed down and people are losing their jobs. And it's going to be quite frustrating for people in the city, seeing like the city which once had all this glory suddenly is dying off. So when... Uh, the city announces that, oh, we're going to spend uh, this amount of money to commission an artist from West Africa or to come and do this project. People will get angry. <laughs> People are like, how can you spend this amount when we need a gym, when we need this and that and that? People have their priorities, mm. you know? <laughs> so then someone goes online and makes a, a comment saying, we're going to burn this work and the building. The city will panic. Like, oh no, we don't have, this can cannot happen under our watch. We're going to invest money into uh, security, mm. into this, into that. So at the end of the day, we need a security company that can watch over the work in the period. How much is it going to cost? $150,000. Uh, uh, we need this and that. So at the end of the day, there are costs or things. Or there was another case where there was a project in Germany, again, where they they were afraid of someone setting the building on fire with the work, blah, blah, blah. So they had to rent a pump from Switzerland, which would were, was connected to the installation system where if there was fire water would come down the building and uh, quench the fire, blah, blah, blah. The, the idea of that insecurity alone cost the museum 500,000, eh, 50,000 euros, wow. just a pump, which was never used. Wow. It was just a security measure, <laughs> you know? Incredible. <laughs> exactly. So again, then I asked myself, that money in Ghana could have built, an ent- could have built a school, you know? Mm. <laughs> so for me in Ghana, when I'm, for instance, when I'm doing a work in Ghana, and um, I go to the space and I'm like, oh, I want to do this and that and that and that. I'm like, okay, fine, let's do it. Um, um, what do you need? They say, I need this, I need that. And then the fire department is like, oh, um, how can we help? And like, oh, I need this and that and that. And I'm like, okay, so how do I also motivate you? Blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, yeah, but uh, maybe just make sure that we'll send people to help you to watch over and just make sure you feed them give them breakfast, lunch, supper, whatever, just motivate them, you mm. know, things like, it's a different relation to Europe and others, because in Europe, people are already paid, and they're, it's almost a relationship here, everything is almost so formalized, mm. whereas in other places, they're so they're thinking about other means, oh, how can we get this thing done in a very different way, and all that, so I think the context also matters, 
Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I understand that also in the creation of such a huge project, you need to employ, you know, hundreds of hundreds of local yeah. people to help you, you know, yeah. stitch all these bags yeah. together. So again, that brings us back to kind of uh, the, the circular idea and giving back uh, as well to your community. Um, so I, I just love that. I loved reading about that. <laughs> um, so what would be your dream exhibition? Yeah, no, no, dream exhibition. Do I even know? <laughs> oh, or yeah. dream show. Like, dream what show. Would you create? Well, my dream has always been to build a big enough institution that can contain my life's work, mm. something that will become the legacy of your work beyond. Yeah, and for some reason, I've always wanted to do it in my in this age. Mm. Not when I'm older. Mm. Like, I want to be able to do that between now and when I'm 40. Mm. Yeah, because you imagine that if I live 40 more years, then it will be a different chapter where you do different things. So currently I'm on, I'm, I'm, I've been making these drawings on this uh, institution, which is going to become an independent art school where we can invest into, like, uh, local education, art, mixing arts with architecture, engineering, poetry, and all these kind of other things. And yeah, it's, it's something that is yeah, the ultimate for me, how to get that. I think it will come. Every year, I'm inching closer and closer to it. <laughs> it's an economic problem, not more like, uh, so I need to be able to make more money in order to be able to, 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 to set that off. And I think once it starts, yeah, it, it's just a matter of time until it's done. What would you say, or what do you think is the impact that your uh, artistic career is having in your country? Well, to begin with, I guess when through my actions and through the work that I do, it somehow suddenly made artists, young artists, to realize what the real impact of art could be. So before, I think it was more or less about whether you've made a beautiful exhibition, you've done a beautiful work, or, but now it was more or less about the impact. What is the work and what does it do? Mm -hmm. What is the function of it? What does it really do? Or what's the process of it? How does it change our perception of time, our perception of reality, things like that? Yeah, and certainly. So I think that is one of the sensibilities that is brought to the world around. And I don't take that for granted. Yeah, I don't take that for granted, honestly. So certainly, I mm. think that my work has had that kind of an impact on the generation. Mine and, let's say, an older generation. Because even now, and I'm going to see like a 95-year-old Ghanaian artist who lives here. And the idea is to ask him about, we are supposed to do a retrospective of his work in Ghana, uh, at my studio and then a couple of other places. And the idea is that I want to, I'm interested in the legacy of his work and how that through an archive can be impactful as an educational medium to many other artists that come afterwards. And there are people that I'm working with on this project. So the idea is just to see him and to have a conversation with him, basically just on that idea, mm -hmm. and then to see how we can expand upon that going forward. Yeah. I, I love what you shared about uh, the ultimately the impact yeah. that uh, you've had and you will have. Because again, I remember that conversation that you had with the kids. And as I was watching them, and obviously just the quantity of them kind of around you whilst you were talking, I thought, well, surely this is the that pivotal moment mm -hmm. it, that if you speak to one of those kids in mm -hmm. 20 years yes, yeah. and they're on an artistic path, yeah. they're going to be like, well... <laughs> I, spoke, I spoke to Ibrahim and, you know, I was really inspired. And in those conversations, you kind of show and w with showcasing, you know, Red Clay and the other places that you've built, you're showing what's possible. And all of a sudden, an artist becomes a profession that's appealing, yes. that's inspiring. <laughs> and that is, that's a very big thing because... If we think about, you know, the Western world, it's depending on where you are and what you like, but it could be, I don't know, to be an Instagram star or an actor <laughs> or, or a musician, yeah. you know, pop star, whatever it is for different people. But um, an artist is not usually the <laughs> profession that comes to mind when you think about, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. So I thought that was, that was very powerful. So I, what you said lands with me as well. So I think you're <laughs> very right. Yeah, I guess every society has this problem, yeah, of what anyone wants to be. But it's also, I think there's always 
limitation as to how people think about what art is. Mm. That's why I always think that we have to expand it yeah. as a starting point, you know. Because one time I was doing an interview in Ghana on TV, and then people could send in questions. And a woman sent a, uh, wrote, like she wrote a text question, and she was like, like, I'm really, I feel so ashamed now listening to Ibrahim, because my son wanted to do art. And I said no when he was going to high school. And now I listen to him and I'm like, I had no idea art was this impactful or this big or was this extensive and all that. And I wish I had known. Or a woman wrote to me and said, I would like to bring my son to show you what he's done, blah, blah, blah. He came, he had all these beautiful drawings and things. That, and he, this, his son reminded me of myself when I was like that age, when I was like 14, whatever. And I think he's even more talented in that regard than when I was 14. So I'm think I'm looking at him and I'm th looking at myself 20 years later and thinking, what if you had a chance to mentor someone like this with the experience that I had? Because for me, no one was there to, I didn't have any person to look up to. What would it be like to be able to like hold this boy's hands mm -hmm. and then be able to guide him through this world in a different way? So certainly, constellation again, mm -hmm. yeah. How do you think the art scene will evolve in Ghana over the next 50 years? Yeah, I I truly don't know. But what I know is that if we, if we stay true to the community and to the, the idea of potential and impact that our works could have, there's infinite potential and possibilities. Certainly, as I was talking about, education is one of the most big and impactful things. And certainly, I'm constantly asking myself, how do we expand upon this? How do we get more spaces which are more, which more people can learn from? It doesn't necessarily have to be centralized, but it can be somehow disseminated across different regions and all that. So certainly, I think that in the next 50 years, art certainly will not be what it is right now. Because even in our own timeline, we've already invested into enough into changing things. Mm. Like even now, I'm like when I'm in Tamale, like seven o'clock, there are already buses with school kids and their teachers. The teachers are so committed to bring them. Mm. They, when you speak sometimes in English, the teachers, it, language becomes a problem also because of the educational system, because English is the first language of communication in Ghana. Oh. But uh, a lot of like, students, like sometimes when they, it's a bit intimidating when you're speaking English. So sometimes the local language might be more impactful in trying to share an idea. So um, you try, when we're kids, if you spoke the language in school, they beat you up. Because the idea, it was, it's a very colonial thing, like you have to speak English, like that's a proper, mm -hmm. you have to be cultured. When, you, when someone speaks good English, you're like, oh, well, he's very smart. I'm like, have you listened to what he said? He was just talking nonsense the whole time. <laughs> the fact that someone can speak well doesn't mean they're talking sense, mm -hmm. you know. But the idea that someone could be talking the local language and he could be staggering, stammering and all that, but he's making a very good point in there. So... Sometimes when we when we we're, when I cannot describe something in the local language and we have to say it in English, then the teachers would translate would say it in the local language for the students. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that the teachers are not doing their work well or they are inadequate or anything. But the idea is that it's inevitable language because when their kids are home, the local language is what they speak with their parents. Mm -hmm. They are more confident in it. When you say something in the local language, it's more believable because if you see an object which seems like it could have been a museum in New York, and then now it's in your own reality, and then there, someone is describing it to you in the low, same language. It collapses that space. Mm, yeah, it's sad. It's because English somehow makes it more strange because mm. you need that language in order to access it. But suddenly, because you have the same language, we're using the same language to access the same medium, which for so long was somehow removed from your context and all that. Mm. It makes more sense. So the kids are more free to ask questions. They're, it's play. It's like now it's like their playground, you know. Because now when they're asking a question, they are not afraid because when you're speaking English, you a lot of the kids are afraid that they might make mistakes and their their colleagues will laugh at them mm -hmm. or they will not get it right. But the idea is that no, we you're trying to let them know that we even we that are doing this, we haven't gotten it right yet. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we have not got it right. We are only trying to ask ourselves a fundamental question, and I think more artists, not just in Ghana, but around the world, need to ask themselves these questions or need to be in the state of consciousness. The more you ask yourself these questions, the more you do things, the more these all these possibilities open up for other people mm. in the far distant future that we cannot even begin to grapple. Very powerful. Thank you for sharing that.
<laughs> I'd like to wrap up with a really open-ended and inspiring question. <laughs> If you had a magic wand, how would you use it? <laughs> uh, do I know? Hmm. I already think that we have a magic wand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very simple, everyday lives that we live. But certainly if I had a real magic wand, yeah, I always thought that I would, yeah, I'd make the world a better place than it is already. But then already we try to do that through our own work and everything that we do. On the personal side, there isn't much that we need. I wouldn't, I would have never had a magic wand and said that, oh, I wish to have more money. I wish to have, no, I, yeah. But then it was, I think, yeah, I think wisdom. I've always said this to people, that wisdom is the greatest thing that anyone could ask for. And certainly I think that I always say that I wish that I had more wisdom, mm. both now and in my in the past, because I feel like I'm one of those people that believe that time is a continuum. And then though we've lived, our past selves are still living and trying to catch up with what the time that we're living in. So certainly if I wish for wisdom, I would have wished for wisdom throughout my entire life. Mm. And maybe that would have impacted me in my time now based on my past. Maybe my younger self would have been more wiser, which would infect, <laughs> affect my older self. Yeah, so certainly I think wisdom, not just for myself, but the entire world. It's, yeah, that is something that we need. We don't need more resources. We don't need anything. We just need more wisdom. We need more care and other things. Mm. That, that is the greatest gift that humanity can. So not only intellectual, but also emotional wisdom. Emotional wisdom. Sympathetic wisdom, yeah, exactly. absolutely. IQ exactly. and EQ. <laughs> exactly. We need a lot of EQ yeah, exactly. in the world. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Thank oh. you for your time. Thank Beautiful you, conversation. Donna. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>